Angus Young. How you doing? Good, Becca. The offspring. How's it going, Becca? Dave Grohl. How you going, mate? Good, man. Pete, it's been a long time coming. Oh, Becca, hasn't it indeed? We go inside the dressing room, speak to the biggest names in music. Keith Richards, the Rolling Stones. And crack open their esky. This is exactly how I imagined you, by the way, sitting opposite me with a vodka and orange. You're a discerning chap. This is The Rider. Yeah, it's BK. Welcome back to The Rider. Last week was a big one. Brandon Boyd and his new album, Echoes and Cocoons. If you missed that chat, you can go back now and listen to it online on all platforms, but also on Spotify. You can get a music-included version with the stories behind the songs as we play them. So that's on Spotify. Search for The Rider with Becco for Brandon Boyd. Now, this week on the podcast, one of my favourite blokes in music. There's no Tim Friedman from The Whitlams, 1997, one of the greatest albums in my collection, gave you this one, and then years later, Blow Up The Pokies, and in fact, Tim experienced one of the greatest independent releases of all time as well, with Eternal Nightcap, and 25 years on, still one of the greatest Aussie albums ever released. This time around, after 15 years, it's a new album called Sancho. Can't believe it's been that long. And of course, the tour continues as well, the Gaffage and Clink tour. Got a few more dates, including Sunset Sounds, playing Roger State, Hunter Valley in late April. But on Zoom, direct from Newtown, it looks like. G'day, Tim. Where are you, by the way? It looks fantastic. It's very manicured here in Newtown, I can tell you. I bet it is. I bet it is. Mate, good to see you. You been well? I have, thank you. Ask me on your uh, new project. You were pretty much right at the top of my list. <laughs> and also perfect timing with the new album as well. So, you know, congrats yeah. on the new album, which is out now. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. So how long have you been working on it? Has it been a, a, all the way through COVID? Yeah, I started just before COVID. So it's been very patchy energy. Um, we got together in February 2008. 20 recorded um three or four then it all came down we recorded about half of that first six months then i lost a bit of vibe lost a bit of energy and luckily um we got together in august and had a really successful session up in at the music farm and got um four good strong songs to just give the album a spine yeah, because I was lucky enough to see you um, concert hall. I think it was the recital hall. But the recital hall. It was beautiful, and it was such a great vibe. And that was when I heard uh, the Battle of the Birdie Kid for the first time, and that had just been sort of released as well. And um, it was just kind of exciting because we're in that gap between different lockdowns, and um, everyone felt nice and safe. But it was just so good to hear some new music from me as well at the time. Thank you. Yeah, it was November the twenty fifth because I remember it was my birthday. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Yeah. I had drinks afterwards, <laughs> Good. and uh, you're right. You know, we put four or five hundred people in in a in a venue there. It was in, in between the peaks. Uh, you got to be lucky to get a tour away these days. Um, oh. Some people were lucky, and they got their gigs out in last October and November. But I um, I chose to move my to twelve months, and that um, ended up being a bit unlucky. So now we're going out in March. Yeah, yeah, and some have sort of obviously pushed back uh, towards sort of April just to make sure, but um, I'm, I'm hoping that's it. I hope, um, you know, the worst is over and we can all sort of just get back to seeing some bands and, you know, distancing um, is fine, but hopefully we can get back to doing some proper, um, you know, non-seated gigs pretty soon. I think I fit one in before the lockdown last happened and that was nice, it was very strange, but it was good. The Enmore Theatre actually has um, dispensation and they have a – you can stand at the front at the Enmore. I went to one gig at the Enmore back last June just before things got bad and, and yeah, it was standing and there was a proper mosh pit and I was thinking, this is so weird, but it's it was just so nice to have the energy off the crowd and, and being sweated on and whatever. I didn't care because at that <laughs> point – we all felt rather safe at that, that point back in June. I mean, this is your seventh record. It's been a 15-year wait. It doesn't feel like 15 years, though, because, you know, you had your solo album out a few years ago. Um, you've, you've been touring on and off all the way through that, but it's a really big deal for Whitlam's fans. Yeah, the, the 15 years snuck up on me as much as it snuck up on anyone. Yeah. Um, right, we did just enough for people not to think that we'd gone away, but um, we hadn't put out new songs as a band, and... Uh, so um, 
there's been a lot of people, you know, waiting for it and have a listen to it. But the reviews have been strong and the fans, which is most important, are enjoying it. And so um, it, the rollout's been as, as smooth as I could have expected, actually. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, did you have to wait at all for vinyl wait times or anything like that or was it pretty much exactly oh, we've, I'm getting the test pressing this afternoon, actually. Exciting. Um, people that ordered the vinyl through the website, we told them that they'll get it they won't get it till April, but the CDs have gone out, and and of course it's on the streaming services, which is where most of the volume happens these days. That's right. Yeah, I mean we we sort of depend on vinyl, I guess physicals sometimes, but really, I mean the bulk of it's you know on streaming, and uh, it's kind of weird, isn't it? Like when you're an artist, do, do you check the, the the streaming numbers just out of curiosity on your phone and just see how it's going, or do you prefer to uh, distance yourself a little bit from that? No, no, I've um. Especially in the last two years, I've been trying to understand the new music industry because I'm going to put, be putting out records. So I've got a little bit data driven, and I have um, been following the numbers on my Spotify for artists this week. And um, it's good to hear the phone go zzz, 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 as people listen. It's a little, <laughs> it's like a social serotonin hit, but for artists. Yeah, oh, that's insane because, uh, yeah, I, I love how you've you got the notifications on and, <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it just changes everything so much. I mean, I remember I, I had a chat with um, um, Andrew Stockdale who you, you spent a bit of time with in Byron Bay and he was showing me the the stats and how, um, you know, it comes down to being in playlists but also the algorithm kind of pushes your song out off the back of someone else's song. We're trying to become a streaming band. But, you know, because we're only just re-establishing ourselves, we aren't very successful with playlists and stuff. So we're really depending on the one-on-one relationship with the fans at the moment. But um, they say that this sort of thing it changes over time as you as you push your music out. So uh, we just have to be patient to wait for the new economy to do us some favours. I'm sure we will, mate. It's been, it's been a long wait and I, I know everyone's very excited. So, Sancho, tell us about... Uh, your road manager who who you lost uh, just a few years ago, Greg, and um, did that bring the album on? Is that what happened? I decided to do new music and I had a new spring in my step already. Um, but then Greg died of a heart attack and it, it sort of, I thought, oh, how cruel that he had to, we had to have a tragedy to really um, give me a, subject matter that I couldn't ignore. Yeah. So it became the first song that I wrote. I, I took my note, put my notebook in my pocket and I walked out of the house and I just went for a walk up and down King Street and got a drink in a bar and then wrote a few lines and got a drink in another bar. I was trying to be the romantic Parisian flaneur <laughs> and uh, I got the song. Um, Greg, well, we had a bromance with Greg, not just me, the whole band, because he'd been um, mixing us since 1997 and um, he was pretty gruff and um, had a real dry humour, very efficient, very uh, very trustworthy and honest and funny and um, very good at his job. You know, you always trusted when you're on stage that it was going to sound good when Greg was behind the desk. Indeed, you know, that's why after we took him out working hard, 97 to 2002, he started getting hired by people of the calibre of Paul Kelly and Boy and Bear and Ballpark Music and Tim Minchin um, because, you know, the managers wanted their artists to sound like um, the last mix they'd heard him do. Uh, so he uh, passed on and I decided to write a song about the fun we'd had on the road, not the usual, oh, I'm bereft and drinking whiskey, where's my friend gone type of narrative, but more we had a ball out there on the road and these are some of the funny things we used to say and, you know, I relied on him really. That's why the chorus just says, I want smoke and mirrors and I want gaffage and clink. Gaffage and the clink. Crew, the crew gives you the smoke and the mirrors and no matter how dusty you're feeling, they sort of prop you up and, and get you up on stage. Do you find it's easier to go into the dark um, when it comes to writing a song when you're writing about someone who's passed on or – is it, is it actually harder to be a, a, an upbeat, positive song after that? We do both types <laughs> here. At the we've got lots of happy songs and we've got, and we've got some real-life um, tragic songs. Uh, and it's the same on this album. There's some really joyful stuff and upbeat pop. And then there's Sancho. Uh, so 
I like being a bit um, schizophrenic with our, our 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 themes and our moods. I think people are used to it now, to be honest. So it's not too much of a worry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was always wondering sort of um, what sort of headspace do you have to get yourself into, but I love how you just went for a stroll and, and just did normal stuff, go for a drink, and, and I guess you just never know when, when the right idea is going to pop out of your head. Well, I just need to relax, I found, and right enough that you can discard 80% of it. I've got the notebook from that first day. There's probably two lines, you know, out of it that ended up in the song, but at least I started the process, you yeah. know. Started thinking, started reminiscing, started getting a bit of ink on the, on the fingers. Great cover, by the way, from uh, Megan Washington as well, by the way. I really enjoyed that. I didn't know it was her song until I heard it and then went back and, and I was like, oh, my God, that, that was a cover. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I connected with the lyric and then I realised that she really underproduced the track on her own album two years ago, which gave me an opening to overproduce it. Um, we didn't go too over the top, but we did go to the trouble of, you know, making it different, making it more hypnotic, um, putting nine piece strings on it and um, having our own tape because I think she just wrote a uh, she wrote a great song. And you've had some great covers in the past. Um, don't believe anymore the the Ice House cover again sounded like a Whitlam song. Let me think. I suppose that 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 one, especially the five minute version with the Australian Chamber Orchestra in the middle, was a big production piece. Uh, and um, Apart from that, I suppose, well, we started off as a bit of a covers band. We do, you know, like a lot of bands when you have to play for two and a half hours in a beer garden, you know, in Coffs Harbour. Yeah. Uh, on a Sunday afternoon, you do um, as many Bob Dylan and Neil Young songs as you do your own. Probably our best known cover was sung by my colleague, Tim Hall, on Eternal Nightcap, a real rousing version of Tangled Up in Blue, which um, gets mentioned a bit in... Um, Bob Dylan covers sort of columns. I've never been frightened of a cover. It's part of our DNA. Yeah, yeah it just it, it just started off the album really well. I loved it. And uh, I, I'm still learning things about the Whitlams, though, over the years. Um, I, I didn't know you... Oh, you, there's a lot of stuff you don't know as yeah. well, too. I'll tell you, I'm bet. keeping some stuff for later. Keep, keep it to yourself. <laughs> but I didn't know you and, you and Steve met at the Big Day Out in 92. I didn't know that. That's what I said. <laughs> I said a lot of you and I's. Yeah. We, the truth is... Well, we were there. We were on the steps out of the Horton Pavilion and we didn't go in because we were having too much fun. So everyone talks about how they saw Nirvana <laughs> and it changed their life. We heard them through the side fire exit <laughs> and had another beer. Uh, it was the first day where we really got spent, we got really sloshed together. We had um, run into each other at gigs because his band had opened for my band, Penguins on Safari, plus the Plunderers, you know, at the Harold Park Hotel. Yeah. And so we'd been just um, friendly acquaintances until that day when we really sort of had a nice long drink and decided to, um, you know, put the band together. So that's, that's the story you, you, you put out to the journos. It makes sense because it's, it's like... But that's the truth there. Yeah. That's the yeah. truth. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just... We did know each other because we we were Newtown identities. Yeah, sort of yeah. Thing. and there's a lot of people as well who said they were there in the Horden for Nirvana, and and in the end you do the maths and you go, wow, I can't believe they fit a million people in there. That's insane because everyone was there. Yeah, no, it was crowded. I remember just feeling the sweat come out of that fire exit uh, and the heat. But um, yep, yeah, no, didn't go in. <laughs> no, and and in fact, their uh, their A and U Canberra gig, everyone talks about that they're breaking down the doors and the glass broke and. It, you know, would have been an insane tour, but uh, regrets. Um, that's your, one of your biggest regrets is not seeing Nirvana, I guess. No, I've uh. never really regretted it. <laughs> I had a lot of fun out on the steps. Um, yeah. yeah. I wish, I, no, no, look, I was so close. Yes, I wish I'd gone in and caught a couple mm. of songs, but um, that, that's life. <laughs> So how is dad life going? Because last time I saw you, um, you brought your daughter in and we're doing an interview in the studio and she was um, with a colouring in book outside and, and it was normal for her. Um, you know, how'd you go from, from being, um, you know, the gentleman rocker on the scene in Newtown and, and then being a dad? I made the necessary changes. You know, I was yeah. home five nights a week for six nights a week for many years there. And uh, it probably um, helped me in the long run because, you know, got me out of the pubs. Uh, she's um, in her final year of school now, which is not, so it's not a coincidence that I'm starting to tour more and get back to what I used to do a lot of and um, get ambitious again. Um, so it's been a 
really rewarding journey. She's a good musician herself. And um, yeah, we're getting, we're in the final stretch and I'm getting out on the road again. <laughs> now I'm feeling really old thinking, God, it's, it's been that long. It would have been 2010 or 11. And I, yeah. you know, sometimes I had to go and do some interviews and I just, just drag her along. So um, it would have been that long ago, Becca. Do you miss the party sometimes? Like, like are there, there times where you, I mean, the real party times where you're going out and everyone talks about, you know, the Newtown scene. You were the person you had to spot in Newtown if you were out on a piss. <laughs> it wasn't hard. <laughs> um, you're going to find me somewhere. Yeah. No, because the party's still going on. I'm out on the lash once a week having a great time, having Excellent. a good long time, you know, and um, I still let my little bit of steam off and, uh, you know, I can't wait to get on the road because it's almost like uh, – Sometimes if I'm going through a health kick, I'll say to people, I, I, I only drink when I work, which is the opposite of everyone else. Yeah, yeah, and, exactly. And, you know, I just love to have a glass of champ- two couple of glasses of champagne, get on stage, have a glass of wine, and then have a beer with the boys after the show. Um, it's, um, it's a wonderful way to make a living if the tour is going smoothly. It really is. And I know a lot of um, musos find it hard to sort of – get the balance right sometimes uh, when they're on a really long, grueling tour. Um, I mean, Tim Rogers was on the podcast, you know, a couple of weeks ago and he was saying, geez, you know, it's, it's a fine balance of, of how much you drink pre-show or if you drink pre-show. Um, you go through a time where you try and do it without having a drink and it's a real challenge and it's a balancing act, I'm, I'm sure. It, it is. I've been at it so long now, I, I know the tricks. The tricks are sometimes – you're quite right. He's quite right. Sometimes you, I actually prefer to do that to drink before the show. And if it's a, if it's a grueling three weeks, I have a rule: where you don't drink after the show, because that's when the easy ones go down. Oh, it is, and, and you got to get on, get up, and then go on the road again, and jump in the van, or fly, or, or whatever the next yeah, day. I, I love those couple before and couple during. I find them more important than the ones after, to yeah. be honest. So, okay, so the podcast is called The Rider, so I have to ask you, what is in The Rider? I mean, I'm assuming there's a bottle of red in there because that's, that's your trademark with the bottle well, on stage. Um, well, here's the big connection, of course. You, you're asking about Gaffage and Clink, mm. and the show's called The Rider, and Clink is The Rider. Clink's The Rider. Your show, your show should, could easily be called Clinkage. <laughs> if, you're, if you're on the road with the Whitlams, your show would be called Clinkage because that's what we call the rider. And it's called clinkage because that's the sound it makes in someone's duffel bag as you smuggle out the excess after the show. <laughs> clink, clink, clink. And um, that's why that's backstage lingo in the song, smoke and mirrors, gaffage and clink. Um, and uh, then there's Colonel Clink, of course, which is a reference to Hogan's Heroes. But if there's a Colonel Clink in the band, he's the guy that grabs the rider at the end of the night. Our riders... Um, Oh, it's pretty moderate, actually. Uh, we just have um, a couple of dozen beers, uh, one bottle of champagne and a couple of bottles of white and one bottle of red. And uh, we had spirits for about six months. Uh, that was a failed experiment. <laughs> well, see, I was told to by a previous band that uh, in the early years when, when the budgets are a bit lower and you're on the road um, every day, um, spirits are the way to go at that stage because there's always leftovers because you've got to finish the bottle. So, so you take the bottle with you and they can't dispute it or anything. But if you're asking for a slab of beer, you've got to leave behind usually whatever's left. Well, so no, you clink it. Or you, or you clink it, yeah. You clink it, mate. Yeah. Yes, that's the whole point. That's the point of this interview. You clink it. <laughs> I'm actually glad you told me what the clink is because listening to the song last night, I, I know, of course, we know what gaffage is, but I was thinking the clink. What What is the clink? Now I know what the clink is. Rider. The rider. It's um, been 15 years and it has been a, a big run since Eternal Nightcap. And I was going to ask you, is there a chance of doing an anniversary tour, playing the album in full maybe in the future? I know you've done it a couple of times, I think, in the past, but not a full tour. Yeah, we just did it with um, – we did a small run with orchestras, I think. Yeah, I think that was probably 2017, probably 20 years. Yeah, I'm thinking of doing it um, later this year, to be honest, um, because it's 25 years yep. since Eternal Night now. And um, I'm actually going into Studio 301 in Sydney on Monday because I found the half-inch masters of Eternal Nightcap. Wow. And they've, they've baked them, they put them in the oven, and then they play them once and put them down. So I'm actually remastering it from the half-inch for vinyl. So if we don't play it 
in its entirety. We'll, we're at least putting out a, um, you know, nice heavy vinyl 180 gram, I think they call it, mm. um, remastered from the half inch that I found. So uh, we're on the same wavelength there, Becco. Needs to be, something needs to be done about the 25 years. Yeah, well, there you go. That's that's good. That's good to know. I'm excited. Now, are you still dividing a time between Byron and, and Newtown or, or um, are you back permanently? No, I'm in, um, no, I'm in Newtown. I'm in the city. Uh, I've got a house in Broken Head, it's called. It's a wedding venue, so it's always busy. I can't afford to have two houses. I'm in the mid-level of Australian show business, not the upper level. <laughs> but I did ask you, I think, last time we caught up that uh, you were in the circle of Zac Efron at one point because he was your neighbour, I think. Oh, yeah, he just rented next door for a little while during the lockdown. And, um, uh, yeah, I just showed him around the suburb. He's a nice, thoughtful young chap. I bet. And certainly, you know, everyone was going to Byron to get a piece of Zac Efron at one point. Now, I'm going to ask you about Sydney, all the v- venues that are doing it tough at the moment. Uh, the land's down. Um, at this stage, the music venue is, is, is gone. Um, one of your favourites, probably the Sando. That, that's like, is it still a holy moly? I can't remember. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's about to change again. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, even Frankie's Pizza or whatever. Um, do you think the Sydney scene will, will have a bounce back after COVID? Is, is there a hope? This hope it's important that the venues get government assistance because I think musicians are remarkably resilient. We can find other things to do while we wait, um, but we're only going to be able to bounce back if the venues are still there. And um, let's hope that most of them are, and that you know this the Lansdowne isn't the canary in the coal mine. Um, I'm worried that people have got out of the habit of going to see music and that when we do come back, it's, it's going to be harder to get people along because habit, habits have changed. The New South Wales government has started to actually admit that the nighttime economy is important. So at least we haven't got the government actively campaigning against us. So I think that's one reason why we might bounce back quite well next year. Yeah, because you've had just a bad run with um, lockout laws and even if I want to throw in the bushfires before COVID, it was just a really bad run. It was the Liberal state government and yeah. they decided to just change the nature of the city and they just, <laughs> to think that the free market group bunch of, of right-wingers are the ones that over-governed, which is what they accuse the left wing of all the time. Exactly right, that, yeah. They were just too, it was just bad policy. It, they hadn't worked out the consequences and how it would just turn Sydney into a big country town. I mean, we, everyone knew that the lockout laws in, in Manly weren't working at the time, and so I don't know why they, they thought that was a great idea for the rest of the city, um, but also leaving gaps you know, in the city where you could be open, and it was just too confusing. And uh, and also one thing we don't, we don't realise, when you're a punter, you don't know that these venues are actually paying rent. They don't often own the venue. They're, they're paying rent, so... You got, the, you got the guys running the lands down who, um, you know, it's the end of their lease and they, uh, you know, have to move on. And, um, yeah, I, I sort of certainly hope it gets back to half of being what the good old days were like. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, Enmore near me is going to be an entertainment precinct and there's, a, there's, you know, there's three or four gigs, you know, within 500 metres. So, yeah, uh, all things being equal, we should bounce back okay. The Battle of the Birdie Kid. Um, that's the first song I saw played off the album live, um, as we said. Um, tell us about the story behind that song, because you ended up meeting him eventually. Mm. Well, Bert was an English immigrant, came out, lived with his granny in Tassie, and he moved to the mainland, and he became very um, innovative and active criminal, a safe cracker, horse race fixer. And um, he, uh, he had a lot of cops on his payroll and um, he was very successful for a long time. His luck ran out and he ended up in jail um, for about 30 years in all, which is a long time. Uh, When he was released about four years ago, um, Peter Dutton thought he was so dangerous they wanted to um, send him back to England. But, you know, he'd even done national service in Australia, so he won that court case. So he lives a quiet life near Launceston now. Um, That's Bert. I... I just heard this slapstick story about how he was involved in a robbery where the blokes all put their balaclavas on too early. And um, and I knew it, you know, sort of romanticised one of his failures, so I wasn't sure that he'd like it. But when I got in contact with him through his biographer, they said, oh, you can even use his name in the title because 
we're putting out a, a series of books that are um, his autobiography uh, as told to. And um, so uh, we all got quite friendly, really, and he was fine with the fact that the song was, you know, took a few liberties with the truth. And um, so when I had my solo tour to release the single, I booked a gig at Launceston just to meet Bert. It, it was a, you know, three weeks' notice playing it in Launceston. And so we got to have dinner and I got to hear some, um, got, a, got a feel for his energy, got a feel for, he's a little fella, but pretty imposing even at the age of 87 and um, or 85. And um, heard some stories about the old days. And so it was a, it was a real meeting of worlds, yeah. Was he threatening? He told a story on stage that um, he tried to be menacing, but he was all, it was all a bit of a joke or something. His friend had rung up and asked if I could sell his books at the merch stand. <laughs> That's right. And I, and I, then I, so I just told as if I was, how, would I, how could I say no? That's, yeah. That was how I framed the story. Yeah. But Bird himself was never menacing to me, no. He was, um, frankly, it's strange when you meet people like that who've got colourful pasts. It's hard to imagine their colourful past because they're sort of pleasant old chaps, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, some of the, the absolute worst. You go, oh, he seems like a good old bloke. He'd be, <laughs> yeah, he'd be fine. Oh, mate, it's been great to spend time with you and and look at it once again. Um, you know, I, I can't believe it's been fifteen years for this for this album, and I, I know a lot has changed, obviously, with the way you. Uh, record and write a song, but maybe it hasn't. Maybe it's still just having a notepad and recording in the studio like, like you used to. Well, nothing. No, I, I, that's, that was one of my um, moments where I um, freed up myself. I realised that I just needed to do it like I used to, which is doodle at the piano with a cassette player and then get the guys in to play live. So uh, when I realised I didn't need to reinvent the wheel, it all started flowing. Perfect. Well, um, Sancho is out now, and Tim Freeman. So good to see your face, and uh, we will have a beverage, and we'll uh, see you in concert. Uh, hopefully, in the next couple of months. Tim, thank you. See ya. Thanks, Becca. Always an interesting guy. There he is, Tim Freeman for the Whitlam's. Go and check out the brand new album, Sancho. It is out now, and still a few more dates in that Gaffigan Clink tour. And also go back and check out if you missed it, Brandon Boyd from Incubus. He doesn't do many interviews, Brandon, but I was very lucky to. Get a hold of him and pick his brain on the new album, Echoes and Cocoons, and also you can get the music-included version on Spotify as well. Next week on the podcast, Dave Faulkner from the Hoodoo Gurus. The new album is out, Chariot of the Gods. And unfortunately, they've had an issue with COVID in the band, so the tour has been put on hold till the end of the year. But we'll talk to Dave Faulkner next week. This is The Rider with Becco. We'll catch you then. We'll catch you then.